Hey everyone, welcome to Fellowship Church Online. My name is Rich Pankos. I'm the Connections Pastor here at FC. I'm so excited to be able to start a new series, uh, a new series called Love Where You Live. Uh, so it's November, these holidays are coming, and it's kind of good news, kind of bad news thing for many, right? Um, for many of you, it's great news. You're excited, it's tradition, food, fun, seeing family and friends. But for others, it's it's not so good news. Maybe you recently lost a family member or or this brings up all that emotion behind that or maybe you're just alone this holiday season. I always pray that our church family is very aware of those of you guys dealing with that and that we show compassion and love for you in this holiday season and throughout. And then for some of you this holiday season, you're dreading seeing that someone, the mother-in-law, the strange aunt, the very opinionated uncle, the mom who constantly questions you as a parent or asks you when are you going to become a parent, a grandfather who's a bit too spirited with the spirits, often drinking far too much. Uh, and listen, if none of these are your holiday dread, maybe it's others dreading you. I'm kidding. I truly believe this is the most challenging time for many, but it's also the full of most opportunities, especially I would say for those of us that would consider ourselves Christians. I mean, if you're going to invite someone to church, a holiday that celebrates the reason for the church is a great opportunity. I would say it's probably the safest season to talk about Jesus, at least I hope, right? So we're starting this new series today regarding relationships, and this talk, we're talking about the importance of loving others you know, real, true love. And I start by asking all of you this question. What if God loved you the way you love others? And that was a challenging question for me, honestly. And it should be a challenging question for all of us. See, many of you know the great commandment found in Matthew 22, where Jesus states to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And he even goes on to say, love your neighbor as yourself. So love is clearly important. Uh, he commands it. So how are we doing with it? Well, to find out, I think it's best that we first define love, but love as God describes it. And we'll do it through the Apostle Paul as we'll look in 1 Corinthians. Many of you guys have seen this verse um, or heard this verse at weddings, uh, but don't worry, single people, I just want to assure you this is not a marriage series. Here's the scripture we're basing this whole series on. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 7 through 4, it says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I love that scripture. These verses, I, they they're actually include 14 descriptors of agape love. That's the highest form of love. And these descriptors are all verbs despite what it looks like. This love from a godly perspective is defined by what Christians do or do not do. It is not primarily about feelings. Oh, we fell out of love. I don't think you could ever fall out of real love. See, love is action. It's the choice to do or not do in relationships with other Christians. Uh, in this case, as he talks to the church in Corinth, but also those outside of our faith. Uh, if we have an interest in ha hopefully having them join our faith, we have to love them. So let's dive a little, little deeper into those action words today as we see how we can apply these during the holiday season, um, even to them, even the ones you're dreading seeing this holiday season. And listen, if you're not a Christian, uh, obviously this doesn't apply to you, but I would think if you do apply it during your holiday season, I would guarantee your holiday would be better for sure. So we start with that first part of that, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, it's 1 Corinthians 13, 4. It states that love is patient. Okay, well, I'm, I mean, I'm out. I mean, if, you, if love is patient, um, that makes it very difficult for me. And, and you're probably out as well. You have to be patient to be loving. Uh, that's very difficult. Aren't we, again, aren't we all out now? So I was just in New York City. We were visiting my son, Bennett. Um, and let's be honest, New York City, not a very patient place. Uh, we're at this red light. Light turns green and immediately everyone behind me is beeping. And it's not just like the, me, me, excuse me, can you... No, it's more like a, like, have you ever driven in New York City before? It's like a, a very annoying, loud beep. Um, New York City, clearly always in a rush. To love is to be patient. Love actively waits for others without resentment. Uh, this would include being patient in the face of being hurt or mistreated. Uh, patience in the Bible is the ability to endure difficult people. Any of you have any difficult people in your lives? Yeah. And it's also the ability to endure situations without giving it to anger or giving up hope. 
See, because God continues to show us patience when we're doing disappointing things, we can show others patience when they disappoint us. Many of you heard about uh, David in the Bible, right? King David, a man after God's own heart. And he's known for a lot, good and bad. Adultery and murder, bad. But in so many other examples, very good. Uh, David had some key moments uh, in his life where he showed an enormous amount of patience. He had this former friend, Saul, try, who, who tried to kill him many times, right? You've heard, some of you have heard this story, but in a nutshell, and I'm going to kind of fly through this, but Saul, he's king at the time, and he needs a harp player. Don't we all need a harp player? Uh, but David happens to play it. So Saul grows to, in this relationship, grows to love David. They hang out all the time playing harp for him and all that. But David, um, it, it, this gets good until the f fact that David defeats Goliath and then kills so many other enemies, uh, more so than Saul does. And then all the people are talking and they're all like loving David far more than Saul. So this jealousy develops between these two. And um, Saul decides it's a good good time to get rid of um, his friend, his former friend, just by killing him. I mean, that definitely took a turn, right? And we see it in 1 Samuel 19, starting off in verse 1. This is, look at how many times this happens, right? Verse 1, Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. Verse 10, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with a spear. Verse 11, Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. Verse 15, again, then Saul sent the men back to see David and told him, bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. Uh, verse 20, he sent men to capture him. Verse 21, he sent more men. And then we go to 1 Samuel 23, 15. When David was at Horish in the desert of Zip, he learned that Saul was to come out to take his life. And then finally, 1, 20, 1 Samuel 26, 2. So Saul went down to the desert of Zip with his 3,000 select Israelite troops to search there for David and obviously to kill him there too. So it's, it just, it fails every time. And interestingly enough, David is given two clear opportunities to kill Saul, but he doesn't. And we see this in 1 Samuel 24. Again, you should really be reading all of this as I'm flying through it. So Saul is, is um, hunting David, right? And he just, he happens to have to relieve himself. He has to go to the bathroom. So he goes into this cave where David and his men happen to be hiding in. So David and his men see Saul coming and Saul has no idea that they're in there, right? But all of David's men whispered right away. They're like, look at this. God has delivered him on a platter to you. But it's fascinating. Instead, David crouches towards Saul with a, with a knife and he just cuts off a piece of his robe because he feels guilty. See, even though David has been anointed and will be king, and we see that back in uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, he can't attack God's chosen king. He shows patience. So David walks out of the cave, bows to Saul, and he asks why Saul's attacking him, and he shows the robe as proof that he could have killed him. Then we see David show more patience in 1 Samuel 25, where David meets a bad-tempered ruler named Nabal. His name, funny enough, means fool. Like, I shall name my son Fool. Uh, but Nabal is a stand-in for the rich and foolish King Saul and refuses to recognize David as God's anointed. David protects Nabal's property and employees, but Nabal refuses to return the favor. And in anger, David gathers his army. But Nabal's wife, Abigail, approaches David and warns him that revenge is not the way God saves. The military attempt at self salvation will only cause guilt, just like he, David would have experienced in the cave. Abigail reminds David that God will deal with the wicked King Nabal by his own hand, not David's. And sure enough, David waits patiently, and Nabal actually dies from a mysterious illness. So patience rewarded. Uh, the other time David is given the chance to kill Saul, he repeats what he said in the cave about not attacking the Lord's anointed. But he also learns uh, from Abigail that valuable lesson. He knows God's hand will kill Saul, not his own. And his last recorded words to Saul are confident because he knows God will rescue him and tear down Saul. Soon he will take the throne. Patience. See, some of us have a Saul in our own life, not that we want to kill, but someone who deserves something. And maybe today God is telling you to be patient and allow God to be God and do what he will do on his own time. And I'm so certain that his conclusion will be far better than ours anyway. Can I tell you something that has helped me immensely with this patience thing? And there's two things, right? For one, as I grow older and develop more self-awareness, I hope so, right? But can anyone truly say I have great self-awareness? Um, but the more I understand myself, the more I see how difficult I can be at times. Ask my wife, ask my kids, ask my close friends, ask some of you watching this, right? I'm impatient for sure, set in my ways too often and irritable at times. I'm not easy and none of you are either for the record. So I start by looking at myself and thanking God for his patience with me and those around me. 
Secondly, I, I lowered my expectations of others. Man, I had high expectations on people, right? But if you're, you know, if you're always on time, I'm having to be always be on time. So when someone wasn't on time, I had, I was so critical and so hard on them because, you know, whatever your gift is, you expect that out of someone else. When you're kind, you expect kindness in return. See, we have to realize that we're all very different. My family, my friends, my coworkers, all wired very different, different gifts and different annoyances. It's funny how we think we can get angry enough at someone and totally change who they are. You know, if I get mad at Tony enough for being late, he'll, he'll be on time next time. Willie, Tony just arrives late. Let's allow Tony to be Tony. Or let's give Tony a fake time so his tardiness won't affect us. I'm kidding. Don't lie to Tony. In regards to patience, we have to know that it's not passivity. To truly love anyone is to allow them in and be able to one day let them know that, hey, their behavior, their tardiness in this case, gets you worked up a bit, right? Hey, Tony, I'm sorry, but I, I just have to let you know that you being late often is causing me uh, I'm a bit, I'm getting a bit irritated. I just want to tell you one-on-one -on -one because I don't want it to increase this feeling internally because that's what happens. It just increases internally. Let's be honest. At first glance, patience seems like inaction. After all, impatience means that when someone accidentally annoys you, you don't act annoyed. When someone hurts you, you don't take revenge. When life keeps you waiting, you don't take every conversation as an opportunity to vent. So patience is, I guess the question is, so is patience basically not giving in to impatience when you face something difficult? Well, it can look that way because patience means restraint. But to see patience as only something you don't do is to miss the kinds of powerful things that patience can do. Check out what Proverbs 19.11 says, that a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. I have to imagine all of us um, watching this have an example of jumping the gun or overreacting due to a lack of patience. James 1.19, some of you know, you know, it's all about being slow to anger, slow to speak. That has everything to do with patience. And sadly, all of us have stories of being rather fast in reacting, uh, either in words or anger, full of regret. See, if we truly love people, we'll be patient with them, since love is patient. See, patience to me shows true faith. When you hand off something to God, hand off someone to God, and not intervene, that's true patience. So verse 4 also states, after love is patient, says that love is kind. See, kind people are generous, they're helpful, and they often think of other people's feelings. Uh, before, uh, you know, beyond mere politeness, kindness, uh, it really does involve acting for the good of others, even when it doesn't benefit ourselves. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. See, every day is full of opportunities to be kind, which in turn shows love, which in turn points people to Jesus. That's the Great Commission, right? Found in Matthew 28, where, where to go to make disciples. So it, start, it starts with kindness, then goes into love, and then, then we get to talk about Jesus. Because the opposite puts up walls and, and pushes people away, never even want, wanting a conversation with you, let alone ever being allowed to talk about your faith. I wonder how many of us would be shocked to even hear we are Christ followers just based on our lack of kindness to others. I wonder how many people we are not an influence to at all because of our lack of kindness. I imagine most people watching this, listening to this, would consider themselves kind, but kind in this verse, promoting love is action, would or should have a second guessing that. Kindness at this level is not just saying thank you to someone or smiling. Kindness is action. It's next level. You know, I'll give you some examples of that. Using your umbrella to walk someone who forgot theirs into a store. Paying for someone's coffee, next, uh, the next person in line, right? Bringing a meal to someone who could really use a meal, someone who maybe just had a new baby or somebody grieving. Sending a surprising, encouraging text to someone. Or, or just asking someone how they're doing and truly listening and then checking in soon afterwards. See, kindness is aware of those around you this holiday season who are grieving a loss or alone, and you actually do something about it. You send a card, you invite them over to your holiday celebration, whatever that is. That's real kindness. This is love, and that shows Jesus. And again, that's all about the Great Commission. So be patient and kind. And then the verse continues, verse 4 continues, says, do not envy. Love does not envy. See, envy was alive and active even in the Corinthian church, uh, perhaps even including like the envy of spiritual gifts and financial success of others. See, love sets self aside and celebrates the successes of Christian brothers and sisters. 
my gosh, I think this is an epidemic, especially in a social media world where we see highlight reels and we wonder how they always get to go on vacation or the kids are so perfect or look at another job promotion. See, when those items bring up ill feelings in us, that's all on you. That's not on them at all. See, we as Christ followers should celebrate moments like that, not envy. Believe me, you got your own stuff where they may be looking at you the same way, but wouldn't you want them to be genuinely happy for you? So celebrate others, congratulate them, and be happy for them. That shows genuine love. Next, we see that love does not boast, which sounds obvious, right? But boasting is the work of self-promotion in obvious and even subtle ways. See, love quits that job and goes to work praising God and other believers instead. As Christ followers, we only boast in him because we understand we are truly nothing without him. See, I love this statement. I say it quite often, but we really are. We're nothing without him and we're everything because of him. Nothing without him, everything because of him. Next, we see that love is not arrogant or puffed up or proud or other, other translations we'll use. See, this arrogance involves confidence in oneself above all others in the expectation that everyone else should feel the same way. Love removes the obstacle of self from the purpose of serving others well. Love has no ego. I love this acronym. Years ago, I heard it for ego, E-G-O, edging God out. That's what we do when it's more about us. See, ego and pride are so relevant, even in Christian circles, because it feels like everybody knows everything. I heard it said that in regards to pride, right? There is nothing more natural to man, nothing so insidious and hidden from our sight, nothing so difficult and dangerous as pride. Pride does, in fact, lead to a fall. Uh, think of all the sins you dealt with this past week, and I'm hoping not too many, right? But I imagine pride had a lot to do with each one. You want what you want. I love what Jesus says in John 5.30, By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. See, Jesus' power is submission to God, and our power comes through him and him only. It's the upside-down world of Jesus. It tells us that the more we surrender, the more we win, and the less it's about us, the better for us. If anyone were to deserve to be puffed up, it would be Jesus. As we know, he was, he was always taking a direct opposite path there, right? Washing the disciples' feet, tolerating the disciples and their failures, even eating with a man he knew would kill him. I don't recommend that. But allowing Judas at the table, that fascinates me. Even calling him a friend at the garden. Who is your Judas this holiday season? See, maybe you're gonna be with yours this holiday season too. Maybe that's the opportunity. Verse 5 states, It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrong. So dishonor, we'll start there. Dishonor means to bring shame or disgrace to others, and it can ruin reputations, which in turn never allow one to repair or come back from. God has a way of humbling others. Our, so our need to go public with dirt to do devastating damage to one is meaningless. Love is clearly not self-seeking, that second part there. It's not self-seeking. It does not need to have its own way. See, love yields. See, much of the Corinthian church's problem had disappeared once they focused on looking for ways to meet each other's needs before satisfying their own. Easily angered, um, that's the next one. James alludes, again, we already talked about this, being slow to anger, but see, love is not irritable. A quick temper is often evidence of viewing others as obstacles to reaching one's own goals. Love views serving people as the goal itself, removing one reason to flare up when they get in our way. Next, love keeps no record of wrongs. Well, there goes my score sheet. Uh, we have to get over things. Too many, even in this, uh, even listening to this today, are holding on to things they stated were over. If we truly forgive, we don't constantly remind. Constantly visiting past hurts, sins, mistakes, it keeps them present. It's a common thread in conversation and all the emotions return. How many times can you remind your spouse, family member, or a friend of something they completely regret? How do you think this is for them or their self-esteem or their demeanor in general? I, I, can, I cannot even imagine going into every fight with a loved one who has something on me knowing that I'll just be reminded of it every day. If God buries your regrets, your sins, and your mistakes, who are you to keep digging up the ones of those around you that hurt you? Next we see that love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. Any time a believer finds him or herself tempted to root for or enjoy injustice or wrong choices, we can know we are not motivated by the love of God or each other. Why would anyone rejoice over wrongdoing? Perhaps we root for someone to get wrong, to get revenge. You know, we're always trying to play God there, but 
see, we, you have to know we all reap what we sow, but on us, uh, us on the outside should not root for one to get theirs. And I know that's hard because some of you right now are wondering when so-and-so will get theirs. Lastly, love defined by Paul states that it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love protects, it bears all things. Love doesn't say this far and no further. Love is not limited by what, what is reasonable or by what other people would be willing to put up with. Uh, this does not mean that someone should allow him or herself to be continually wounded physically or otherwise by other believers or family members. But sometimes love bears pain from a safe and legal distance. But true godly love doesn't quit when others become difficult. Love trust it, uh, like, love, it, love trust it believes all things. Uh, it, it do, that doesn't mean it's gullible. Now, the choice to believe those who may be deceiving us removes the burden to catch others in the act of lying and projects onto them a respect they may or may not deserve. The one who is loved carries the burden to be truthful or to be held accountable to God rather than us. Love always hopes. Love hopes in all things. Love roots for victory in others, for good to win, the truth to come out. In the Bible, hope is more than just a wish. It is a confidence that God will do as he says. Paul began this whole letter to the Corinthian church back in 1 Corinthians 8. He says that Christ will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. His confident hope for them was one of the evidence of his love for them. And lastly, love always perseveres, endures. Love endures all things. Christians face hard times for sure. Those who choose to love as Jesus does do not stop loving when life becomes difficult. Love for God or others endures. It perseveres through tough days and long nights. Maybe you've already used your words to try to get a friend or a family member to know Jesus and it didn't work. Um, on a side note, you ever have someone in your life continue to tell you how much they love you but not one action proves it. Um, but what if this year we used our actions, right, instead of those words? You know, it's action that, that speaks louder than words anyway. And it will in turn lead to words, the most important words we'll ever share with someone, the gospel, Jesus. Um, it's the biggest and most important decision one will ever make. But you get to set the table, and he does the rest. So in uh, person at our church uh, this particular Sunday that I'm speaking this message, we're giving out wristbands that actually have um, on it, it says, Love People in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, so just by you watching online, I'm going to ask you to use a rubber band for the time being because I think this could be really good for all of us as a church. My thought is that you all wear it throughout these holidays to re as a reminder to love. That rubber band will remind you to be patient with others, to not to react too fast, right? To allow God to do the work. He's got a far better plan for the one who you're impatient with anyway. Maybe you're driving and you just, you see the rubber band. That'll help you when somebody cuts you off or whatever. That rubber band will remind you to be kind, um, right? I'm hoping it provokes acts of kindness daily where we can literally change one's whole day. Uh, that rubber band will remind us to be genuinely happy for the successes of others, not to compare or to, or to envy, right? Maybe we're scrolling on the computer, we see that rubber band, and somebody's on vacation, we can love it and hope that they have a great time. That rubber band will remind us not to boast, as it will remind us that we've done nothing and he's done everything. The only puffing up we'll do this holiday season will be because of the food we eat. Uh, the rubber band will remind us to not allow our ego to edge God out. Our humility this ho holiday season will stick out and have all those around us wondering how. The simplicity of that rubber band, the, the prompting, can completely change this holiday season for all of us. Remember, these actions of love require no responses, so don't expect them, because true love has no agenda or expectations. God sees no one else has to. Lastly, let me assure you that all of these actions are not just helping others. The, so you will certainly reap the benefits as well. Ask anyone who serves in any capacity who's gone the extra mile for someone and ask them how they feel afterwards. I already know the answer. See, we feel best when we make it about others. We are at our worst when it's all about us. But to make disciples, you better look and act as one. That rubber band inspiring you to truly love can change the course of this whole holiday season. It can change the course of someone in your life from being an empty, chasing everything for happiness person to one filled with the Holy Spirit, eternity set, and peace instilled. This genuine love for others is the best way we can bring others to know Jesus. I always love this quote from St. Francis of Assisi. He says, preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. Our love will speak loud. Let's change our families, our friends, and this community by being the best example of love we have, Jesus. 
So if you're with me, let's close our eyes together and ask God for help here, right? Father God, as we go into this holiday season, uh, I know that a lot of us have a lot of stuff going on, or maybe we're dreading seeing some people. Uh, maybe again, we're just uh, all alone, or maybe we're just going, we're grieving. Whatever it is, I'm just asking that you help us. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you so much that um, we, we, we get to do life with you. We feel genuine love from the greatest example of love. So we, we so appreciate that, but we want to in turn love others like you love us. And it's not easy. So I'm asking as we go into this holiday season that you give us the strength and the power to do so. Because we know that if we can love others sincerely and authentically, uh, we have the best chance of bringing them to know you uh, and you are love. So I'm just asking for your help this holiday season for each person listening to this. And I pray that we can look back at this holiday season and see people turn to you because of the way we love them. Uh, we get to be that on-ramp for that, that you use us um, as a tool to do so. That'd be amazing to look back at. So I'm asking for this um, in your name, in Jesus Christ. Amen.